Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 28 of the Make Music Income podcast. You know, questions, we all have them. We all are trying to figure out how does making music income really work? What is the secrets? What what are Steve and I talking about on these podcasts? What are we, <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> what are we talking about? And uh, we get a lot of questions to um, our YouTube channel and to, uh, well, not to the podcast, but questions about the podcast on the YouTube channel. And so today I'm going to, we're just going to do some question and answer from what you've been asking. So I, I think these are going to be helpful for just about everybody to kind of hear some thoughts that and questions that people are having about the content that Steve and I have been putting out. And then I'll be reading the questions and then we'll just do our best to give you our answers to them and uh, just sit around <clears throat> and BS like we always do. Um, you know, so a lot of your comments are great and we really, um, we really appreciate everything and you seem to appreciate the candor and honesty that we we try to provide and, and we're glad that info is helping mm -hmm. so let's uh not mess around here let's let's be very candorous and honest and uh answer some questions but first as always let's take a real look at what two full-time music income dudes are doing this week steve what's up in canada Today. Oh, dude, I am um, I am writing a ton up here, and I'm in yeah I'm in full writing mode. Last month uh, I'm making up for lost time here. Last month wasn't a big writing month, and I'm on a tear up here in Canada nice. in miserable rainy Vancouver, uh, where we have yet to see some real summer weather. Uh, so yeah, it's actually kind of working out for me because uh, yeah last. Yesterday, I randomly just okay. So the so the challenge theme for this month uh, in the academy is to get out of your comfort zone, and start working on some music that you've really never messed around with uh, at all. And I wouldn't say I've never written like an electronic style track before, but I don't really write that much electronic music. Anyway, I I wrote this like dark sort of I don't know if it's dark, but it's like almost kind of like a house meets chill wave electronic track yesterday very ambient lots of synths um, and it took me into the most interesting direction and uh, I kind of asked the members whether they thought it was licensable or not I'm going to send it mm -hmm. to uh, Motion Array and see what they say cool. um, and, but it was so much fun man it was so much fun to just like dig into something that uh, like is totally outside my wheelhouse um, and uh, man, it's just great to do that. Uh, otherwise, I'm working on like a five track EP, which is sort of like a folk slash country inspired uh, singer songwriter uh, album. So it's gonna have lyrics and everything. And, I, and, and lyrics are a real tough thing for me. Uh, I'm not a wordsmith. And so um, it, that probably takes me the most time, but writing those tracks is really fun because it's all kind of guitar based. And that's something that I'm you know really comfortable with. So the tracks Will this get- Will be for art list? Yeah, that, that that's the uh, that's who's gonna get it. Uh, for who's gonna, I'm gonna pitch it to them first, and if they don't want it, then I was thinking it might be cool. I, I something that's kind of on my list of things to do this year is to reapply to Music Vine, um, and I may have to do that under kind of like a different artist moniker because I'm not sure how they feel about my working with Artlist. But um, I thought maybe if I send them a, a, a you know some new music under a different project name that that could help. But I do really want to. Uh, be on Music Vine, so it would be cool to have some new music yeah. to send them. But if Artlist if Artlist takes the music, then you know, of course, the, they'll get first dibs on it. But uh, w yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, and that's been my last week. Yeah, pretty much. I haven't done much else. Cool. Well, um, I have, as always, been pretty busy. Started a new class of students this week uh, in the recording uh, s stuff that I am teaching now at a local institute. And uh, got some decent composers, uh, some decent arrangers, some artists, and it's going to be a good class. I'm really excited. It's a lot of fun to talk about. We spent yesterday just talking about uh, critical listening and listening through a bunch of songs. And we actually went through each song that each student kind of threw out and said, this is one of my favorite songs. Mm. And then everybody else, just their job was to critique it since it's not their favorite song. It was that person's favorite song. And so... Just a lot of fun things like that, you know, um, kind of 
music experiments and we're in the first week so it's a lot of talking and writing and things like that and not much pro tools or logic just yet but we'll get into all that kind of stuff so that's exciting i've been laboring over a, a video about um digital distribution and distribution out to spotify and other dsps this is uh as i talked about this is a sponsored video by DistroKid, so there's a bunch of how to do distro kid stuff in it too it's spiraling out of control it's uh 20 minutes long right now oh and God. i i don't know if it's going to be a, a if i'm going to cut it up into two videos but right now it's one video but it's just so much i think it's important important stuff that i mentioned through the entire thing but it's just so long hmm. but you know how that is sometimes uh it just takes a while to explain things and and things are important plus i really try to segment my videos with um with times so that people can go to different parts of it and you can use those times as web uh, links. And so on my community page on my website, I will take people just to a certain point of a video that may may not have stuck around for on the first viewing or something Mm -hmm. that really just talks about a subject I want them to talk about. So a lot of important stuff in this in this video about distribution. And I think it's something that everybody on our channels doesn't always pay enough attention to. I know both of us are 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 wanting to do more distribution this this year. Yeah. And I think it's something that gets pushed to the wayside when it used to be the thing before we got into the cool sexy licensing stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it used to be about putting our music out, you know, yeah, making totally. music I'm and putting it out. I'm slowly trying to get back to that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that is what this whole video is about. Yeah. Um I did manage to start a new song this week. Uh, it's a patriotic uh, song, and uh, it's it's very jangly and got a jangly piano and a tuba and stuff in it. So it's very very kind of old fashioned uh, version of a of a patriotic song. And I'm trying to finish that up. It's mostly done. I just got to get that last thing into it, and then I'm cool. going to try to get that up for the for the patriotic holidays coming up here in the states. Um, and then, you know, just continuing to find the right balance for my music, my channel, my clients, my job. It's just uh, there is a limited amount of time where, where there used to be an unlimited amount of time to work on everything. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm not getting on my channel enough and, and this video is taking a week to create and mm-hmm. edit, you know, just because I don't really work on the weekends that much. Um, and then, so that means every day I'm, I get to work on it for an hour or less, uh, mm-hmm. same with music, same with anything. And so, um, I, I am starting a video for a client with one of my new interns at the school. And so that should start to help me get some extra things done and, and, and find more time. But it's a, I think for all of us, it's a balance. You have a job who, any of you who are listening to this or watching this, you likely have a job and you do music, uh, or you have multiple jobs, and you do multiple music jobs like Steve and I. And so it's just finding that balance is, is uh, we, we t- we've talked about it, and we can continue to talk about it till we're blue in the face, but it's it's just a, a continued fight for all of us, I think. So. Yeah, it's a, <clears throat> it's a continued fight to try to figure out what is the best way to approach getting all this work done. I'm um, always yeah. kind of like rearranging and trying to rethink processes Lately, I've been like really into the idea of like batching uh, tasks together um, because uh, I think changing the the task so often during the day is actually very un- unproductive. So, for example, like, you know, with like YouTube videos now, I'll try to think of like multiple different subjects that to write like, you know, to write about. Um, and then I'll film them all at the same time while also doing kind of like uh, like an Instagram or like TikTok version of it as well get that all out of the way and cool. then pick an entirely new day of the week to do editing. Like I'll save all of my editing for like Thursday or Friday um, rather than do the recording and then directly edit it right afterwards. It's too much of it's, it's just to switch the task like that. It's just, uh, yeah. it, you have to warm your mind up to it. So you might as well just batch all of these tasks into like, uh, you know, into idea. bigger segments throughout the, um, throughout the week. So, what I try to do with my morning time, which is which depends on what time I get up, because I don't get in till late, and so um, my mor- my miracle mornings, so to speak, have been become miracle late mornings. Today I didn't get up till ten, and usually uh, before I was getting up between seven and eight every day, and now 
uh, I, I'm lucky to get up at 8.30 or so. But I look at my to-do list and I pick three things that I've got to get done or, or three things that I know I could get done in this one space. Mm -hmm. Things I just have on my to-do list. I have a very long to-do list and, and certain things are in bold that have to be done today for a client or for uh, some schedule that I have. Yeah. And uh, today I made three things and I worked on all three. I got two of them out and one of them, uh, you know, still on. So uh, to me, that's about the only way I can do it is it's just to put a, a list together. And um, sometimes uh, music is in that. Making music is literally on the to-do list. Stop what you're doing and work on the thing. You know, get over here and, yeah. and dust off the keyboards. Literally, I have to dust them off sometimes. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don't, isn't it terrible when you have to dust off your instrument to work on it? That that tells you something that you might be. I, not I working yeah, well, it. I know. I mean, I, dust just collects like crazy in my apartment. I got to dust it at once a week. Um, but yeah, it's funny that you write. You would have to like write like write music on like the to do list because it's it's so funny because it's like you get so like you know how it is. I mean, you just get so wrapped up in all these other tasks that um, yeah. that fill up your to do list that it's like. You actually have to remind yourself, uh, no, you got to like push all these things aside once in a while and actually just get creative. Um, and, and sometimes I feel like the, the natural intuition is to is to just like wait till you feel inspired to be creative. Mm -hmm. But in fact, that's not the most productive way uh, for me to approach it. Um, like for me, it's just like, no, you have to force yourself, like you have to force yourself to go to the gym. And sometimes uh, you'll find the inspiration and, and the, the, the juices will flow uh, and other times they won't. But if you don't force yourself into the position where you like you have to kind of exercise that that creativity, then it's it's, you know, waiting around till you get inspired is, is probably not the best uh, is probably not the best um, tactic for getting work done. Have we done an episode yet like that about how to make yourself get stuff done, how to the no, art man, but of. The art of sitting down and and uh, force creating, basically, uh, it's forcing it's, inspiration. Oh, well, inspiration mm -hmm. is like yeah, like it, like treating it like a like it's like a muscle that needs to be you know. I think uh, I've seen Daniel down. do stuff on this before. Yeah, you know, he would. He's talked about this, and I think maybe we could uh, come up with an episode like that sometime. That might be good. Totally, because it, it, you totally. you you have to sit down and just work like any other job. You know, exactly. like we have to sit here. We literally have to schedule a time to do this podcast every week. And if mm -hmm. we don't do it, it doesn't get done. And so we have to schedule it. We have to be there for it. And, and writing is a thing. Composing and producing has to be a thing like that. So it absolutely does. It absolutely does. Because I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll start the, the writing process and feeling very uninspired and then yeah. wind up, you know, inspiring myself somehow, you know, magically in the process. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you do, but if you don't actually have a regular schedule, then um, you won't be that product productive, in my in my opinion. Right. Won't be industrious, as we said last week. That's right. Um, all right, so let's get right to the questions now and really start to dive into answering some, some questions we've had uh, on our podcast. I think you will find this interesting. I think somewhere, somehow, one of these questions is going to affect you if you're watching or listening to this. So let's get right to the first one. And the first one is just from four hours ago. Okay. Um, it was a reply to our How We Make Music Now, uh, six months later, which is uh, episode 20. If you haven't seen that, we, Steve and I, go in through and talk about our income sources and how we I get going and Lars Anderson sent a message on YouTube this morning and asked, Steve mentioned educating himself on the subject of Spotify. What sources can you recommend for that? Oh, dude, I was actually, yeah, I, I was actually thinking about making a uh, YouTube video about this. Uh, I, I can't give enough praise to these guys at Indo Indopreneur. So check out Indi in Indopreneur. Indopreneur.io. Yeah. It's uh, indiepreneur. So, so I N D E P R E N E U R oh, okay. uh, dot I O. Um, these are these are uh, some dudes that are are uh, and gals that are based out of uh, Orlando, um, mm -hmm. and they're a team. I think they started off as like a three person team, but they've grown uh, considerably over the years. And I've been following what they've been doing for a long time. They have a YouTube channel as well, um, and they are uh, master marketers. 
um, and they've really, really locked down a system to help independent musicians uh, grow their fan base um, and also market effectively through uh, through advertising. Um, that's their specialty. So um, their their training vault is is jam packed with uh, information. Every day I, I go to the gym for about an hour and a half, um, including this morning, and I just listen to their trainings and I learn a ton every day. These guys are great. Um, and there's a lot of other people who, who, um, who preach this kind of information, but I, I just find them very accessible and, and very, um, I don't know, they just really know their stuff. I also would want to give Andrew Southworth um, a mm -hmm. shout out as well. He, a very informative guy, a little bit more technical, um, but in terms of like setting up ads and being very transparent, uh, he's, a, he's a great source of information as well. He just did a video last night about uh was it spotify he's always got a lot of videos like we do so if you're trying to learn totally. these processes but uh yeah his video last night was how to get on a spotify editorial playlists mm -hmm. and um but yeah andrew is is somebody i would love to interview or we should interview or something like that and For have sure. him on uh also tom dupree the third is also doing right. a lot of this kind of stuff and does great stuff um there are other people that if you search our YouTube channel and other people um, come up, uh, but specifically for this, yeah, I'm also Ari of Ari's Take. Right. Um, if you look up his channel, he talks about Spotify and, and a lot of artist stuff. And so I think this Spotify really falls into the artist stuff, but I'm doing a video right now about getting your music to distribution. And uh, maybe that might answer a lot of your questions too, but one of the things that I go into there is that um, how important it is to put this stuff out there because it's not just about being an artist. You don't have to be an artist, but you do have to be a brand. And so hopefully Steve and I both will be doing some education about that on our channels. Yeah. But um, for you now, yeah, Andrew Southworth is, who, is where I would go first and entrepreneur, they do a good job and there are um, some other people who do good jobs as well. Yeah. So uh, another question from the how we make music income now was from Tony Thomas who asked, so it it seems like music licensing is dying just as I am getting started. What is next? So uh, this is a rather broad question, but um, it, it's an understandable one. I think for a lot of people right now, they're, they see the race to the bottom in stock music. They feel like there has been some discouraging thoughts about sync and 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 how I know you had a great sync video up last night and uh you know I think people are 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 just jumping into music licensing now uh, at seeing videos like ours and Daniel's and other people's but they're they're now starting to feel like that the, the market is saturated dying tough hard you know all that kind of stuff any advice for someone just getting into things and going, wow, what is it? Is it still going to be around? Well, I mean, I think, I think that the royalty free, like the stock music uh, situation, is probably a little bit less equitable, equitable as as it than it was like you know three or four uh, five years ago. Um, I think that the uh, you know what we've seen with the um, the kind of rise of the the subscription model uh, libraries has, has created a different sort of um, environment uh, for for royalty free music, uh, much different than it was just a few years ago on Audio Jungle, for example, um, where a lot of authors were able to bring in you know a few hundred bucks a month uh, without too much hassle. Um, now you're kind of seeing, um, I think, like a less equitable distribution of of the money that's coming in so a lot of the top authors are getting, are kind of getting doing really well and then uh and then a lot and then there's a lot of people um that are that are you know having trouble making like even the 50 dollars threshold um you're seeing larger uh, corporations uh buy out some of these uh libraries audio jungle has you know gone through a, a, a number of changes in terms of uh you know them moving everything to envato um the, their subscription service uh, pond five was just bought out um, you know, uh, Artlist is, is kind of dominating um, that the, that whole scene. So there's been a lot of changes, and and uh, pretty they're pretty radical and, and and probably a little bit uh, discouraging to some people. But I think sync licensing in terms of like you know finding placements for TV uh, and uh, and and that kind of thing is still I think I think it's still a thriving market, um, and it's always been saturated. It's always been saturated. There's always going to be a lot of competition. 
um, to, for placements. Um, and I've always firmly believed that no matter how much the market changes, uh, if you're writing really compelling, strong music, then opportunity will find you because there's always going to be a demand for, uh, mm -hmm. for great music. There always is. Yeah, and I think with stock, you have to really look at it in several ways. You're either going to write exactly what the stock market, the stock music uh, libraries, uh, that w stuff that really gets a lot of downloads, and you've either got to write in that style, mm -hmm. or you've got to write. Um, I think stock music is also a place that is ripe for people who like to create music that is seasonal or is right. useful for certain things. And, and that's really where more I fall. I don't make as much as someone like yourself who's writing more for the YouTubers who are using music behind their videos and they, they're looking for certain styles. They're looking for lo-fi. They're looking for uh, up-tempo uh, up -tempo things for corporate type of uh, music and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And while I write some of that more, Often or not, I'm writing a jangly piano uh, patriotic piece, you know, just because it's it's like you said, like your whole. Uh, I'll probably just submit this as a uh, thing to your, uh, your your challenge this month because it, it it's not that it's out of my wheelhouse. Um, the problem is I've done so much stuff, almost nothing's out of my wheelhouse because I've done it for some client at some point in the last twenty years. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm like the genius of all brand, of things, but I'm just saying when you have a lot of experience working in a lot of different genres. There's very few that, like, I can't do metal. I don't have any, <laughs> I, there's no way for me to do metal. I mean, I guess I could get by <laughs> some samples and stuff like that. And, yeah. But I'm just saying that I, I feel like I do that all the time. So that wouldn't seem much, that'd seem like work to me. So I might just submit something that I've done that has been out of my wheelhouse. But again, to answer this question, um, sync is uh, the other side of the coin. And I think it's just, a long game and you have to be willing to play it if you're not going to play for a long time and you don't and you're not going to stay in it forever and music is this way in general i tell my students all the time the number one way you can keep doing music in life is to keep doing music and i will say the same thing about sync the way you can have success in sync is to continue getting better and keep submitting to sync libraries and and trying to find that that person it's really no different than when we used to be artists and we were trying to find that record company who really just dug or that music publisher if we're if we're songwriters who really really loved what we do and they just said wow your stuff is exactly what i need for this company these are just music publishers these sync licensing companies they're just music publishers who are looking for music that is already produced instead of the song though they're looking for the song and the production. And so then they say, oh, I have uses for this. I have clients who need this. I have films who need this. I need TV people who need this stuff, advertisers who need this kind of stuff. And so you just have to really, um, you really have to uh, keep at it. It's not dying. It feels like it's dying because people uh, poo poo it and they might uh, get uh, mad because they're not making enough money at it. And I certainly know what that, that feels like. But at the same time, uh, you could also flounder around in any business. You could start a, uh, any kind of consulting business or a lawn service business or whatever and not have a lot of work for a long time because you haven't built up the clients, you haven't built up the, the background. So Yeah, well, it's, like, it's like, like any business, you know, what's yeah. the product? Are you, are you making the product for yourself or are you making the product for, for other people? And I think sync licensing is is a, is a unique. You're creating a unique product product because people are so I think accustomed to writing music for their own pleasure. And I do that too. Um, you know, I write music that like I don't really think is licensable at all, just because it's fun and you know, and it's a creative exercise. But um, I think in order to see uh, some success in in sync licensing and and the st and stock licensing, whatever it is. You really have to write for the libraries, man. You really have to write mm -hmm. for the kind, you know, the the kind of music that people are going to download. And you know, there's all sorts of, you know, kind of guidelines to, um, to, to pay attention to there. So, um, I think it's it's really a question of how um, much do you want to do that. 
uh, as, as a music producer, how comfortable are you with that? Because not everyone um, is willing to make those kinds of uh, compromises with um, their, uh, you know, their, their artwork. Uh, for me, it's kind of like a fun exercise. Like I enjoy the exercise of writing uh, music that I know is going to be uh, down, you know, get a lot of downloads. Like, you know, corporate music is a perfect example because, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, not, you know, it's not, it's not music I would ever, ever use to advertise uh, my artistic side. I would never put it on my Spotify profile. Like, you know, just that's not the point. Uh, corporate yeah. music, I write corporate music so it gets plenty of downloads on Motion Array and, and I make money from it. <laughs> And it's like, it's a business. It's a business, right? I'm separating my artistic uh, inclination from that process a little bit. I mean, it still is somewhat artistic, but you know, it's more designed for a specific purpose, which is to be synced to video. I will take a counterpoint to that, my friend, because I think that one of the reasons why I don't make as much and I will have to find the right people is because I made a promise to myself for the most part, when I started at least sync work, that I was going to create whatever I want to create. Mm -hmm. I was going to create stuff. I was going to create songs. In fact, I called my I call my uh, music licensing company Positive Spin Songs. It's about songs. It's not about uh, useful things for uh, for twenty seconds. It's it's about songs that can be used. Now, maybe they only use a piece of the song, but they can be used in TV shows, they can be used in movies, they can be used by companies, but they are real songs. They're not songs for licensing. Now, on the stock side, a lot of times you are doing a little bit more, okay, I'm making this rule, two and a half minutes, mm-hmm. or two minutes, and I'm, and I'm doing an ABA thing, or an ABAB thing, and I'm, 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 I'm trying to come up with things that YouTubers can use. That might be a different kind of thinking as far as making music. Mm-hmm. But I... I personally um, tend to write music that I want to write and that's probably why I don't make as much as other people make in this is because I I, I just am not at a place in my life where I want to do as much work as much as my own art. So I'm trying to mix this and I know a lot of people watching and listening to this are going to go take one of our sides and go oh I'm just I'm just doing this to crank out the tunes and get the and get some income in and I just hope I have fun along the way and then there are going to be right. be people who say yeah Eric I'm the same way I want to just make my music and I want to get it out there that's a tougher road it's a way tougher road to get people to love what you love it's not easy it's like the students we talked about last night they showed me the songs they loved and not everybody else agreed with them in the classroom sometimes up to half of the class said that's trash. It's not. It's not good music right. to me, and so because um, it's so subjective. And even the people that you are applying your music to or applying, sending your music to, they're very subjective. It's going to be what they like. If it doesn't match what they think the the industry needs, you're not going to get uh, any response from them. And sync is not going to work. Or and in some ways, stock is the same way. Art list is is very. I'm sure there are people at Artlist, Taxi, whatever you want to say, there's someone somewhere sitting there going, I, this doesn't work for me, and mm-hmm. therefore it's not going to work for our clients, and therefore we're going to reject you. Yeah. And so yeah. that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, everyone has to draw their own own line there. Everyone has yep. to draw their own line. I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion that you can do both. You can you can express your you know you can dive into your creative side and do it for you, but you can also uh, write music that's for uh, that's uh, you know strictly for uh, for sync licensing, and you can kind of uh, you know I at least that's what kind of gets me excited is doing is doing a bit of both, but um, but yeah, everyone's got to draw their own line. Not everybody's comfortable uh, doing anything other than just like writing the the music that makes them happy artistically. So I, I totally get that. Here's a question that uh, there's a few questions we get sometimes that are um, they're not misguided, but they're somewhat misinformed. In other words, they're asking questions about things that uh, aren't uh, answerable because they're not apl- they don't work that way. And one of them was this was off one of my videos about content ID, and someone said, "Can I apply for content ID without my YouTube channel being monetized yet?" And so you mm. see the problem there. It's it's and my answer was col- content ID collects um, from any video that uses your music. In fact, there is no reason to wait until your channel is monetized 
as that is not really what content idea is for. So people think, oh, if I make a YouTube channel and I put my music on it, then content ID will will pay me. They will. I have. I, I saw. Did you see any of your own stuff on your on your uh, identify report because I did. I saw a few of my own videos that had like a play or two during that time that they. Oh no, uh, yeah. no, I hadn't. I, I didn't. So I actually. saw some of my videos that I had made of my songs that garnered a penny or something like that, <laughs> or a piece of a penny. But the what content ideas for is to gather money from your songs that are being used by someone else, and and that's that's what I tried to tell them in this answer. Does that make sense to you? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, the whole the whole YouTube the monetization thing is is, is a it's it's a convoluted. So it's not a no surprise to hear that that question. But yeah, but you you some you said it. You uh, couldn't. Say I just it feel like a lot of people better. are making YouTube channels to put their music on, thinking that they're going to make money from content ID by putting their own music up on their own YouTube channel. Right, and right. then they mix in, oh, but I'm not monetized, and that has nothing to do with e with the equation either, because monetizing is your channel being popular with viewers, not having anything to do with content ID. So um, yeah, this well, is we, where we make, we... it's two separate streams of income, right? Like, because mm -hmm. we monetize our YouTube channels. Once you get over a thousand subscribers and a certain amount of watch hours, you can monetize your channel and take a cut of that ad revenue from your own videos, but content ID, applies to wherever your music is landing across the whole YouTube uh, universe. Um, so you don't, it has nothing to do with uh, your own channel's monetization. Yeah, it's more about the music you're putting into libraries that's then getting used by other YouTube exactly. channels and then making income. And you could use it yourself. I mean, if you make a, vir a viral video with your own yeah, you can. track, sure. that's, yeah, you can make some money from there from Content ID. Here's another kind of interesting, weird, uh, not weird question, but, um, this was a, another, um, I think this was just another video of mine about stock music and sync licensing. And it says, when a library takes over registration, it means that they simply list themselves as the publisher right away, right? But in any case, you must give them your ISRC so that they write you to the author's share. Without this, they have no right to license your composition, right? Well, here again, we have two things that uh, one of these things is not like the other. You know, we have the uh, song being licensed by a company and then becoming the publisher. That's pretty normal. Or if you got your songs published by a publisher, that would be, you know, pretty normal that they would become the publisher of the song. They would take the, over the publishing rights. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, and it doesn't happen right away, by the way. It takes, it could take a long time for that whole process to happen. Now, ISRC, though, is a completely different thing and, and has really nothing to do with, with publishing uh, ex except if your song has a code somehow used when a radio station plays it or a TV station plays it. I don't even know if TV uses ISRC. But ISRC codes are, are something that came about 20 years ago or so, and they say, this is gonna fix everything with radio and everything's gonna go digital, mm -hmm. and ISRC codes are just gonna inform everybody how to get paid, and voila, it's all gonna be fixed by ISRC codes. And people are still trying to embed ISRC codes on CDs, and who's buying CDs? I don't know, but uh, they're not embedded in waves, and so if you upload a wave to a anybody, it's not going to be something that's transferable uh, with that. And I haven't had any libraries ask for ISRC codes yet. So I think you can actually embed ISRCs into waves. I'm, I'm not totally you can, sure. You can it, into MP3s, but not <clears throat> waves. Not waves don't have readable metadata, but uh, MP3s do. I think AIFs do. Okay. But again, we're dealing mostly with waves when we upload to a library. We're uploading high-end things to them. And so but it, it still doesn't matter because even if it, it, something did have an ISRC code on it and somebody put it on their YouTube channel or it got into a TV show or something, um, at, the, at that point when a TV station is going to, uh, or a TV, uh, a, a TV show is going to use your song, they're going to be working more with the, with the library straight away and uh, there's going to be other codes that are used other than ISRC. I don't, I've, I've not delivered any ISRC codes to any library. 
I have two um, to art list. They asked for ISRCs, um, and well, that's because they're doing so much through Spotify and stuff. I think. Yeah. Well, uh, whenever you load, uh, whenever you upload a, a track to Spotify, it generates an ISRC code um, automatically. Or, or you could put your own in if you have your own. You could put your own well. in. That's right. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's a international standard recording code for anyone who's wondering, uh, which is a yeah a code that's assigned to a piece of music set for commercial release. And this code allows the rights holders, whether it's an independent artist or a major label artist, to identify and track the life of the recording. So it is a digital fingerprint uh, in, in theory. Sense. Yeah. In theory, uh, and uh, it, it is something that uh, DistroKid, CD Baby, whatever, will assign to you for free as part of your yeah. um, uh, of your song. But you can also, like, I have my own uh, five digit uh, number of for my songs, and so I just make my own um, ISRC codes and assign them to the songs. And so when I put a song up to CD Baby or to DistroKid or whatever. Um, I'll use my own ISRC code uh, thing, and I keep it in a in a in a spreadsheet and what they all are and all that kind of stuff. So I always have them if anyone asks. And some people and a lot of sites do ask. And yeah, when you get into sales, um, they use the ISRC codes more as identifiers. But again, on the licensing side, I have not seen ISRC really ask for. Have you seen it ask for on any licensing sites other than um, our list? No, I, our list is the only library that's, I mean, that's asked me for it. Um, definitely have never had to upload any of that information to like any other uh, royalty free sites. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of it getting licensed, I mean, I think that the, your IPI number and uh, would be like the more important, uh, uh, you yeah. know, information you, regarding like your... fi fi filing uh, or uh, cue sheets and stuff like that from the broadcaster side um, so that they can, uh, you know, so they can make sure that you get, get the money from your uh, performance royalty organization yeah and explain what ipi is i, I can't actually just... remember what the uh ipi the stands ipi for. it's it's just the number that is used to identify who you are with as right. far as a, a performance rights organization bmi ascap socan whatever yeah. you have a, a a number an identification number that they know to pay to and it'll it's, go um, to yeah, it stands for in, uh, in, interested party information. <laughs> I never knew that actually. Yeah, uh, well, we're the interested party because we want to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> Usually nine to eleven digits long. It's an international identification number for uh, yeah your your PRO registration. So uh, assigned to songwriters, uh, composers, and publishers who own the rights to the music. So there you go. Here's a question someone asked me I didn't have an answer for, and I still don't, but we'll ask, we'll throw it out there. When I upload music to Pond5, I notice it downgrades the quality and sometimes adds crackles and fuzz. Does anybody else notice that? Hmm. I don't, I think, I feel like I have noticed, not the crackles and pops, but I have noticed the downgraded quality. Um, and I'm not surprised by that just because of the amount of, tracks that they have on the library i would expect that they would downgrade the quality uh, to some extent i know that like on um 100 100 audio for example they downgrade the quality like uh re like noticeably so so that when yeah. any any of your tracks that you upload if when you look when you listen to the preview they sound terrible um but yeah i wouldn't be surprised if pond 5 was doing that although i can't say that i've ever heard any cracks or pop pops in the in, the, in my preview tracks Okay, I'm looking through here to see if I see any other questions. Um, I don't have them um, completely. Um, someone asked me, do I work in Fruity Loops or Ableton? Fruity Loops? Or Logic Pro? What is this, 1999? <laughs> we call it FL it's Studio FL Studio now, now isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what? I, I, get, I, I have a lot of students who use uh, FL Studio. And yeah, well, so, it's legit. FL Studio is amazing. Uh, they've, they've, yep. they've really uh, uh, they've really done some cool stuff with it. You are we're, we're both Logic users. Yes. And and um, I love Logic. Man, I got nothing but love for Logic. I think if it wasn't for Logic, I'd be I'd be an Ableton user. But uh, it's funny when uh, students so far use Pro Tools, and we teach Pro Tools first, and they learn Pro Tools, and there are there is an assignment where they have to do something in MIDI in Pro Tools, and yeah. It is a struggle. It's rough. Uh, and, and they can only use what comes with Pro Tools, which is not much. <laughs> and then the next day, they learn Logic. And by the end of that day, 
if not the end of that week when we've done several logic projects they're like for composing i'm going to pick logic every time now some right. some of them will go back and say you know what i i would use logic for making this stuff and then export it out and mix it in pro tools pro tools is a better mixer i guess yeah um, well i think I, you can accomplish the same in bo in all daws really when it comes to mixing but yeah there, there's there's little there's little you know granular pros and cons to each uh midi is certainly a a huge advantage uh, in logic it's it's just set up for that kind of thing and for composing in general i think but uh yeah no i have i have several friends who only do their master their like stem mixing and mastering in in uh in pro tools so I'm trying to look someone's for some questions me, here someone's asking me uh if is if there any way to know on pond five or any place uh who buys your song and where it was used and unfortunately uh i don't think that there really is now no if if your music happens and i've never known this to happen and i've heard it happens but i've never known it to happen if pond five or audio jungle or someone that was to download something for a broadcast use and then uh be tracked by something like TuneSat, you might be able to find out who used it and how it was used whether it was used in a television show or if you have content id tracker like identify you might be able to find out who is using it in their video that's the only way i would know uh who not necessarily bought it but uh wh how it was used yeah um, i and i feel like audio jungle is the only library that i ever worked with which shows who's buying like the who the actual client is that that's buying your uh your tracks uh i don't as far as i know i don't think any of the other uh libraries uh give you that information but they're kind of unique in that in that sense that you could you know see a little statement of the company that bought uh that bought your music and sometimes i've been able to track that back to like a live or a video that they posted um, but uh, yeah. Also, Audio Sparks. If oh, anybody yeah. buys it on a larger license at Audio Sparks, you will see, you see who, who it bought is. it and what the use was. Right. I've had two. Uh, I've only had two in the in the year and a half I've been with them that have been used like that, and they were both, you know, uh, one hundred or one to two hundred dollar you know, uses. Um, and they they did they did tell me who who bought it and what they used it for. So that was kind of interesting. So there are a few. All right, so this might be our last question just because of time today. And if you have more questions that we haven't answered, this will be a great video uh, if you're on YouTube to put the questions down in the comments so that we can answer them. And we might even do another uh, video like this sometime where we answer some totally. things. Or yeah. if you're listening to this and you have music production questions, we're talking mostly about um, uh, music business <clears throat> questions in this. Uh, but if you have music production questions about how to produce libraries, different things like that, that might be a good one for us to do on Steve's channel yeah, sometime. Maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do a little community post on uh, my channel and um, you guys can throw all your questions throw the questions on this video or in the in the comments of this video and as well I'll, I'll do a little community post uh, on my channel and uh, in the discord too and we uh, we'd be happy to tackle um, some of those questions for next episode so here is uh, the last question when with the sync licensing you said you have your own publishing company how so how do you do the splits as far as publishing goes with other publishers and so um, I what my answer was depend it depends on the library. Um, I do have my own publishing company, and I also have a writer's account. Do you have a publishing company with SoCan as well? I haven't set that up yet. No. Okay, so I do, and so if I make a deal with a library that wants to become the publisher of it, I just give that up. They become right. the publisher of that. I don't. Now there could be a situation where they say we only want 50% of your publishing. And so in that way, we would be co-publishing the publishing side. We mm -hmm. would 50-50 on the publishing side and I'd get 100% of the writer's side. So that would be an extra special good deal if you, if you found a company that would do that. But most of the time, in sync licensing especially, from what I've experienced with the three libraries that I'm with now, they all require that they become the publisher of the song and they have the full 100% of publishing and you have 100% of the writer's side. A lot of people think that's giving up publishing, uh, like you should never give up your publishing, but that's just the really the way it works 
in publishing. If you're going to be uh, have your music published, which everyone says they want to do, but then don't want to give up their publishing side of the song, but the problem is they'll do nothing with it where the publisher or the licensing company will do something. You got to pay them for their time, pay them for their work. Exactly. The they're, that's the service they're providing. So that's the cut they take. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you have other questions, folks, please put them in comments. We'd love to answer more questions. It's a lot of fun to get prompted by these these questions and also to clear up some some like uh, mis mis thoughts, some some miscommunications that you may have gotten from from some videos, including ours, where you might hear us say something and go, "Did you do you mean this?" And we really don't. And yeah. so uh, I think there's so many uh, things in this, especially on the. Uh, the the making mu income side of things, and that's what we try to answer today. But we'd love to do another one about production, and we both have uh, obviously a lot of thoughts about answering questions on how you might produce things. So totally. Any of the last thoughts, Steve? Or you? No, it was great. That was a great chat. I I really like fielding these questions, and uh, yeah, we should totally do that again um, on next episode, and I do a production version of it. Uh, and yeah, it's just it's good to you know clear up, like you said, and clear up some miscon misconceptions about things, and um, gives us something to talk about. We've covered a lot of territory in the last almost thirty episodes, so we really have. <laughs> And so if number one, if you have more questions, put them below in the comments. If you have yeah. ideas for shows that you'd like to see us do, that's right. Put those in the comments as well. That helps us. Uh, we both of us have to create a lot of content all the time, not just music content, but also content for our channels. Mm -hmm. Steve has content for his uh, for his whole academy. I have co content for my live videos, so we can always use more ideas for content. Throw it up, throw it out there. I mean, I have uh, I have 30 more videos to make in front of me and interviews <laughs> I wanna do, but um, still, it's always good. To, whenever I come up with another, I just go right to my phone and type it in my content calendar. So yeah, I that's gotta a, do some on that. That's a good idea. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for listening. And I hope you have a great creative week and make some music and make some music income. Steve, yeah. we'll see you next time, man. Cheers, guys. Take see care. Bye-bye.